Hey guys, it's Alexander Williamson, and welcome to The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium, on top of the world. So, here we are at a very high up elevation, one of the highest roads in Washington State, on the Canadian border, and uh, we are up by Mount Shuxon. That's what that beauty is next to my head. But, I have a question for y'all, and that is, how do fish get five six seven eight nine thousand feet up into alpine lakes is it natural so we're gonna look into that in this episode and more so follow me and we're gonna explore that thought all right guys so we're back in the fish room back down near sea level and let's talk about the population of those alpine lakes and and just basically the mechanics of how these things unfold so I have some quick demonstrations that I want to show you, and then we'll talk about the, the three main ways that fish reach these really remote areas. And there can be remote areas reached such as like Hawaii, you know, when you have freshwater fish living there. That's really a different uh, video that, that we should discuss it in, and that's because of uh, essentially a very long evolutionary process of, of saltwater fish becoming freshwater fish and moving inland um, over time. Uh, so we'll talk about that another time. But right now, I want you to take a look at these angelfish eggs. They're stuck to the glass, and the parents are tending them. Uh, these are cichlids, obviously. But they're very sticky, these eggs, at this, at this age. And depending on the fish, it could be three days, like with the Corydora, or it could be up to a few weeks, um, you know, with with uh, rice fish or other fish before these eggs hatch. And so you can see that they're stuck to the glass. And when they're even when they hatch, they have little heads that are sticky, and they have yolk sacs that they can survive for five days without food. Now they still need to be in water or or wet. Uh, usually would be the case but there are some fish like pupfish or killifish that li they lay their eggs and their eggs actually have water inside and they don't let water out of, of the membrane of the egg but so keep this image in mind and pretend I'm a bird and I've come to a lowland lake and I'm digging around hunting fish I'm hunting fish there's snails here there's whatever's going on. There's a uh, betta is hiding in the power filter, power head. That's a weird spot, betta. Uh, but when I put my hand in, you see things like duckweed and just this other stuff gets stuck to it. Well, birds and and other animals, including bears, beavers, you name it, they're gonna be walking through water and puddles and creeks. And there is the chance that they can get the eggs stuck to them. So that is the least common way. And scientifically, it's really hard to prove that. And, and we kind of call that life rafting. Um, the same theory is thought to be true of kind of animals floating out from the mainland to islands on fallen logs or in, you know, because of tsunamis. Well, this is because of birds, but we do know that some fish, like pupfish, killifish, um, are able to have their eggs actually consumed because some birds do a terrible job at digesting nutrients, which is good for a lot of things like snails and parasites, but they act and seeds too. But some of these birds will then fly up into the mountainous lakes or very far inland lakes that don't have any other uh, way to reach supplies of fish. And then, in theory, the eggs would be on them, and it's, it only takes a few uh, to, to lay them. Now, there's also species of fish that can change gender and that can self um, kind of self-reproduce or... Um, with very small numbers, they can reproduce without inbreeding being a problem. We've talked about that in other videos. But, so that's one one way, and that's one theory about how sometimes fish get way up into 
remote lakes. I just wanted to kind of show you how easy it is to stick to your hand. You guys probably know if you've had duckweed or elodia or anything like that, salvinia. And the next and more probable way that we're going to say that fish get into these lakes, and this is more talking about inland lakes and things, is giant floods. So back during the glaciation of the world, which has happened many, many times, especially over millions of years, the the weight of the glaciers actually push down the entire continent of North America, Europe, and uh, Eurasia, uh, Russia, and pushed down a lot of the elevation. And since the glaciers melted, that elevation has actually returned. In some cases, hundreds of feet it's rebounded uh, and, and caused fault lines where you already have existing tectonic movement going from side to side, sort of, subducting, going under one plate, and um, and then also where it hits, where two plates collide, um, like the San Andreas Fault in the San Andreas Mountains outside of LA, or for that matter, around the, uh, the rim the Pacific Rim, where where we live here in, in Japan. So you get these shallow ponds, and, and there's all sorts of potholes from when those glaciers uh, melted and rocks and all sorts of big chunks of ice would scour out the land. And a lot of times what would happen is a, a glacier, so pretend this, this tank is a, gla a glacier, a solid block of ice. Well, if it melts in the sun, you're going to get water here. It's going to melt, melt, and it's also going to melt from the sides, but it's going to melt there, and a lot of times it would, they, the glaciers would be stuck between mountains. And so you've got this lake, and sometimes, like, in, during an event known as the Missoula Flood, there was a, a lake that went way up into Canada that was the size of Lake, lake Superior, probably, and it broke free, and six to 800 feet tall of water rushed across Idaho, Washington, a little bit of Oregon, and that's how we have uh, our Badlands, not that the Dakota's Badlands, but the, we have an area called the Badlands or the Scablands, also known as the Potholes. Well, there's all these lakes there, and it's thought that the Missoula Flood probably washed over those areas they're they're currently desert like today they're probably 110 degrees and i'm not i'm not exaggerating it's very warm in eastern washington if you haven't lived up here people are surprised to hear that the eastern side of the state is a uh, very hot desert in the center but it is uh it you know it gets 115 117 degrees and on the very hot days in the summer so fish made it from lakes all the way up in Canada, down there. Now these glaciers, they move with gravity. They push down on on the plates, on the earth, and they actually slide as they push down. And so they slide with the tectonic movements of the uh, plate tectonics that now we know is, is how the world evolved and shaped. Now, there is another form of speciation that we see, and we know this because of fossils, and this isn't usually uh, the case with freshwater fish, but it can be. And it, it happens in places like Lake Baikal in Russia. And this is when the actual continents have moved. There have been millions of years passing. And in the case of Lake Baikal, they know at least 34 million years is confirmed. They assume 50 million years in Russia, the deepest lake in the world, probably biggest by volume. Uh, it's arguable. Lake Victoria is also uh, could be bigger by volume depending on the time of year. But both those lakes are very ancient, and the species have evolved. In those lakes, they became trapped. You also get things like the Black Sea, the Aral, Aral Sea, the, um, uh, you know, all sorts of inland seas, the Dead Sea. Man, many of them become too salty for a fish after a while, but others uh, become landlocked. And then you get these trap populations of once uh, saltwater fish, and the salt starts to um, 
come out of the water essentially over time and as as things shift and as it settles especially if it's a deep area uh and the opposite can also happen it can become more salty if evaporation happens and there's no way for the salt to leave through um awkward uh underwater uh springs and faults and and cracks uh that kind of filter the groundwater in the lake. So I just wanted you guys to think about that, uh, that it could also be something that took a long time. But if we're talking about uh, little fish like in our aquariums, it's, it, it could be that, but it's, it's more than likely a, a quicker process. It's more than likely a flood. And like I said, there's glacial period floods, but there's also these very odd cases of tornadoes and water spouts picking up fish and frogs and everything else in the water and throwing them sometimes seven, eight, nine, ten miles away. And that can easily lift them way up into the air. And yes, fish, a lot of them are rugged enough, like a rice fish here. They'd have no problem surviving in a cloud as long as they didn't freeze up too high. Uh, and so it's, it's just, that's another way that fish get tossed around. Uh, so in the Midwest where there's tornadoes and things, it's not, I mean, it, it wouldn't be out of the question to think that there have been some tornadoes over thousands of years that picked up, you know, little perch and other fish and dropped them and incrementally, you know, populated over time. Now, the other thing that happened in the Midwest and in, in Texas and Oklahoma is what we call the Oxbow Lake. And so Oxbow Lakes are, when you have a, a river that winds all over, let's use this tubing, and the the sometimes a river will wind just due to how it's how the the land is it'll wind all the way to this and then the river when that happens the river will reconnect during a flood right here so all of a sudden the water doesn't need to flow all through this water will take the most direct route and so that water will just skip the oxbow and then you're left with half of a circle or even sometimes a pretty full circle uh, of water that's trapped. And over time, rivers migrate and shift due to flooding and due to erosion. And sometimes they shift many, many miles over thousands of years, over millions of years, they really can shift. So that's another way that fish get into remote lakes like the oxbow lakes that's how you get the big catfish and things in these odd lakes that are sometimes pretty small they're old river channels or maybe there was a fork of the river that branched off and went way down this way and maybe it formed a lake there was no drainage for it to get out but water and silt block that 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 fork of the river or maybe there's a rock slide or a mudslide that blocks that route of the river and the main river continues and over here you've got all the same species that would have been in this diverse big river channel and they're living over there so that's another way that it happens and the way that you guys saw those eggs uh stuck with the angelfish here's some more eggs and you can see that they are just kind of floating they're sticky and well if we could get it to focus <laughs> uh, I hope you guys saw it but these are also these are Madaka eggs you can see their little eyes see the little black eyes in them uh, so these ones are very close to being ready but during a flood it's actually part of the strategy of these fish that's why Corydoras and other fish like that actually plan on spawning when you do a cold water change because that means the rainy season is there and it's going to carry their eggs as far as possible and that's why eggs sometimes or fry grow at different speeds it's because these clever little guys have evolved to spread out and to give different clusters of fish different chances of survival so those are kind of the main ways that it happens 
artificially or, or sorry <laughs> not artificially non artificially that that happens uh without human intervention however what bummed me out i don't know why i just thought the magic of of nature getting things way up into the mountains and far out into the desert like the the devil's hole pup fish or you know the texas cichlids and things like that um i don't know why it's always seemed magical to me but you know humans are clever creatures too and if there's a tasty fish you better believe that native americans uh indigenous people all around the world aborigines they would weave baskets or they had pottery and they would take the eggs or uh, more than likely usually the small minnows and the fingerling fish, you know, this big once they knew that they were going to survive. And they'd put them in, in, in Native American. That's what I'll speak to since that's my degree is archaeology and anthropology in Native American and, and some history. OK, so I don't want to go through my whole uh, college career. It would be inappropriate. But in any case, so you've got these fish that are being brought all over. So that's how things like whitefish and trout were brought all over uh, the western United States, up into the foothills of the Rockies, and uh, across the Continental Divide. So that's pretty straightforward. I'm sure you guys can imagine how that would happen. And the last way is more modern ways, where we have things like fish ladders that that maybe we dam the river, but uh, we also then remedy the problem by building fish ladders or delivery trucks and planes. Because in many places, believe it or not, especially here in Washington State, happens in Denver and Montana too, uh, if a lake is popular, even if, it's, you, even if you can't get to it by road, what they'll do is they'll pick up trout from a hatchery, from a fishery, and they'll drop it out of a plane just like you would water onto a forest fire. And then you've got these little trout about this size, about the size of these danios here, uh, that are swimming around. And a lot of times they make it so they can't reproduce naturally. Those are called triploid uh, trouts, like rainbow trouts they do that with a lot of times. So that if there is a native population there um, of other fish, if, if it ends up that the trout decimate something that was in the lake and we, they didn't know about it, you know, maybe it throws off the ecosystem, that they'll be caught or they'll die within a generation. And they'll try that a few times before they um, decide to put fish that can reproduce in there. Uh, but also, as early as the 1860s and 70s, it was very common for American explorers to to take these fish, little fingerling trouts, and to put them in lakes all over the place. So that's the other way that they get from pond to pond, especially as homesteaders moved across uh, the west along the Oregon Trail and other trails that formed after it, and then later trains and planes and automobiles, obviously. It gets easier. We've got dump trucks that, that you'd carry milk or gasoline by hundreds of gallons that we put fish in, and we just pump them out into the lakes. And that's for recreational fishing, usually. But, um, you know, there's also bycatch sometimes with fish ladders and things where they're picking up whatever has gone into the pen that has swam there. And then the last way that fish get to remote places I wish I had some footage of it um, because we we will go out there this year. We, the channel hasn't done it yet, but we're going to go look at some salmon and watch them spawn because it's it's magnificent the way they jump. They can jump, you know, they'll jump out of the water onto a rock and then flip around just hopelessly. Like many die, but some will make it from the rock and then they'll jump and they'll flex, they'll curve and go like a like a they'll be bent like a pringle and then they inverse and it flips them and this is the way how uh african killifish also move and this is one of the ways that they move across land you've also got things like mud skippers but the determination of these fish to survive to seek water to go upstream or to um keep going and just survive is just incredible uh, and so that's another another way that we should definitely mention is that some fish 
are just hell bound to get where they want to go. And if that means climbing a waterfall, by golly gosh darn they will. So I hope you guys enjoyed this little video. Um, it's something that's always been kind of a quirk that's fascinated me. Um, here's some more Corys. The ones who spread their eggs when they think it's flooding. I got these guys to, sp to hatch by uh, faking the wet season. I've got a whole video on that if you want to spawn Corys or rice fish or if you want to spawn like bettas like this this one here. Uh, all this and more. All the interesting ways that fish multiply and survive. Uh, also below there'll be links to some of the fish you've seen here if you want to buy some or the snails and uh, there is also information and some of the gear that I use if you guys are wondering like oh I need a good air filter or whatever that's always in the description too through the affiliate links if you'd like to check that out so thank you so much for watching and uh, I will talk to you guys next time. Take care of your critters, yourself, and, of course, uh, take care of your fish and plants, and they will take care of you in return, and it all gets easier. So, I will talk to you guys later. Um, have a great day, and I'll see you next time.